Hit the record button. Hello, everybody. Welcome <clears throat> to the Contemporary Hello. Issues class. <laughs> Great. Nice to have you here two days before the big election in November 2020. Mm. We are all ready for it to be over one way or the oh, other. <laughs> And we are gonna to talk today a little about political philosophy and government styles with the presentation <laughs> about fascism uh, by Ron Puning. And as I emailed, this is really a study about political philosophy around I know, the world. I that tune, I thought, wow. And <laughs> Ann, maybe know. hit your mute button, Ann. We're listening to your conversation. <laughs> so welcome everyone. And before we start, we'll do the usual announcements. Please mute yourself on the lower left corner of your screen if you're not already muted on the microphone icon so that we keep background noise down. And mm -hmm. we are recording this. I'll go ahead and mute anybody that needs to there. I just muted background noise. And we are recording this for future playback, so please be aware of that. And uh, please be kind and do not dominate too much in your conversation and comments, although we want you to comment and have a good discussion today. So with that, uh, any other announcements that we have? Would, would you go ahead and mute the rest other than Ron, please? Yes, good idea. Also, can you see the first slide? No. No, no. not mm. yet. Oh, okay. Oh. Hold on. I need to do something different. You should have the control to be able to do share screen. Go back to Zoom. Mm. I'm not seeing the whole gang either. Hold on. Mm. Okay. We will get there. Uh, Boy, is there some kind of handoff to give it to me? No, it should be just normal. I don't see anything special going on on my end. Oh, let me try. Wow. Not coming through. <clears throat> Should be right at the bottom of your screen. It's next to participants. Wow, I'm I'm almost. I'm gonna have to come back in this. Hold on. There, I've changed the setting now. Ron, try again. Share. There, there we go. go. There okay. we go. Okay, good. You can see the slide then, right? Yes. Is fascism uh, how it works? Okay, good. Yeah. Now I'm going to put it on slideshow. Current slide, good. I can see your faces and I can also see my slide. Okay. There we go. Okay. Overcoming Sweet. the technical obstacles. Okay. All right. We're good. going to move kind of quickly through the slides because we've got some, some questions at the end we want to discuss. <laughs> discussion type of things. Also, we got a, Steve and I got an email from Harvey this morning. And Harvey had particularly mentioned that uh, one of our resources, Rick Steve's uh, uh, The Story of Fascism in Europe was particularly uh, one that Harvey enjoyed and he recommends it. Okay. So here's the uh, three sources we use predominantly for today's uh, book review or topic. Uh, the first one there, How Fascism Works by Jason Stanley. Uh, he's a Jewish philosophy professor at Yale. Uh, then there's Madeline Albright's book, Fascism, A Warning, uh, which I found to be incredibly uh, good. More specifically, she goes into great detail on, I call it, politics around the world and all the continents, South America, uh, Europe, and with her depth of experience, uh, mm -hmm. really gives some good info. And then of course, Rick, uh, Rick Steves uh, video, you can get that uh, 
via Amazon.com. That's another really good one. So here we go. Uh, simple fascism definition, Jason Stanley says, it's ultranationalism of some variety. And it could be more ethnic, more religious, or more cultural. Uh, Steve Basket provided this right out of uh, Webster's definition. Uh, Webster defines it as a political philosophy, movement, or regime that exalts a nation and often race above the individual and stands for a centralized autocratic government headed by a dictatorial leader. All right. Madeleine Albright uh, has taught or still teaches at Georgetown University in the D.C. area and posed to her class, her uh, uh, political, I think it was a political science class, what, she asked them, what is fascism? Uh, they decided there isn't a, certainly Webster has an official definition, uh, but there isn't a uh, professional society or something that's succinctly defined it. But here were the comments that came from the people in her class. Uh, they said it was uh, a mentality of us versus them. Uh, we're certainly seeing that in our, our country today, uh, a tendency to think of, uh, be it religiously or politically, it's us and them, and us is good and them is bad. Uh, tends to be nationalist, authoritarian, and anti-democratic. Uh, some in her class that they thought fascism had a violent aspect. That's certainly true with the history of what we've seen in Europe. It's almost always right wing. You don't usually hear of a group of uh, hippies from the 60s uh, starting a, uh, you know, an armed uh, kind of activity. It's usually linked to people who are part of a distinct ethnic or racial group who are under often and usually economic stress feel like they are being denied rewards to which they are entitled. And Madeline says it's not so much based on what people have, but what they think they should have. It's also a means for seizing and holding power. Uh, it often draws energy from people who are upset because of a lost war, a lost job, a memory of humiliation, or a sense their country is in decline. And then uh, fastest leaders are usually uh, led by a central uh, charismatic leader who loves to establish an emotional link with a crowd. Certainly we saw in Germany and Italy, two of the early fascist uh, experiences where the, both countries were ripe for an answer, particularly Germany that was having war reparations, huge unemployment, humiliation of having lost World War I. The stage was set for someone like Hitler. Uh, Rick Steves, I, I've watched his uh, video a couple times and here's his observations. He says, well, he, he sees that fascism often offers simple answers to complex problems. People don't like complexity or hear things are difficult. They want a quick, short, sure answer given to them. It tends to exalt physical prowess, sports, and toughness. Uh, stresses conformity, order, and sometimes there was the phrase used in uh, the European uh, Mussolini era, believe, obey, fight. Tough people fight. You want to be a true man, uh, you got to be a warrior, a fighter. Uh, that was the precepts he saw in Europe. It's often preceded by paramilitary types. In Italy, they had a group called the Black Shirts that went around uh, and kind of semi terrorized people. The Germans had the SA paramilitary brown shirts, and they were most infamous for the crystal knock or the night of broken glass. Uh, there's a little paragraph at the bottom here that talks about what happened on that night in 
1838. Uh, it was a horrific night. Over 267 synagogues throughout Germany and Austria uh, were destroyed that night. Over 7,000 Jewish businesses were damaged or destroyed, destroyed. And talk about a mass middle of the night arrest. 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and incarcerated in concentration camps just in a matter of a couple days. And he also notes that uh, uh, fascism often features a strong charismatic leader that capitalizes on fear. Okay, some examples from history. Uh, for those of us who remember the 1990s, uh, the war that went on in Serbia and Bosnia and the ethnic cleansing, there's a map. Uh, you can see that Serbia is to the east of Bosnia and the Serbs set out to ethnically cleanse the Bosnian area, particularly uh, with a lot of violence in Sarajevo and uh, went on the attack. An awful lot of people killed. Uh, typically, this is of course a, a, an example of somewhat modern day uh, fascism that started and took over the uh, Serbian-Bosnian semi-civil war. Uh, reaching well back to 1914 to 1917, and we're seeing a resurgence of that today, Turkey is getting involved with a, uh, a struggle between the Armenians and the uh, a broke a breakaway Russian province next to them. But during that Armenian purge in, that went on between 1914 and 1917, uh, there were over a, a one and a half million ethnic Armenians. And they were predominantly Christians. Uh, they were carried in, out and uh, in, into Turkey. They were often put in concentration camps, deported. Uh, again, over a million people killed. And it was largely an Islamic uh, cleansing of the, cleaning out the Christians in the Armenian area. So that was a, certainly an infamous part of history. Okay, as we look at Jason Stanley's book, he's got uh, 10 chapters. And he said, uh, he sees, uh, these 10 factors as being somewhat fascist policies. We'll kind of try to roll through those. One, a myth, a mythic past. Uh, when Mussolini rose to power in Rome and Italy, he admired and wanted to bring back the early Roman uh, emperor status. He wanted to make Italy great again, you might say, famous. He uh, brought the attention of the Italian people, their uh, history of Roman conquerors, emperors, the great days of Rome. Uh, then going over to Hitler, uh, there is a statue in the Teutonberg Forest in Germany of the uh, German tribal leader, Arminius. And Arminius, uh, ambushed and destroyed a Roman army that was going into northern Germany and wiped out a couple, at least one legion and maybe two uh, in a, a victory for the German tribes against the Roman invaders. Uh, so there's a monstrous statue. You can see it there uh, in the Teutonberg Forest. And Hitler was very proud of that uh, accomplishment of the German society. Uh, the fascist societies tend to like a patriarchal society. They like women relegated to submissive roles. And Hitler, of course, stressed, he thought that the German women should be basically baby factories. That was their primary role, motherhood, uh, producing young soldiers for the German armies to make the country great. Uh, so there's that also the appeal in uh, fascism to reach back to a mythical past. Has anybody seen the movie Pleasantville? Maybe, maybe not. But if, if, you, if you haven't seen it, I think you'd enjoy it. Reese uh, Witherspoon and is that Tobey Maguire? Uh, Alice and I have seen it several times. 
And uh, that would be a good movie to watch and uh, talk about what the meaning of that movie is. Okay. Hitler's uh, book that he wrote while he was uh, actually in prison for a little while is, is, of course, Mein Kampf. Translated means my struggle. He emphasizes in, in that book the aim of propaganda is re to replace reasoned argument with irrational fears and pa passions. He said effective propaganda must be combined to a few points, which must be brought out in the form of slogans. Uh, he, he emphasized reasoning does not attract, emotion does. Uh, as an engineer, I've always been frustrated. I, I like to try to think scientifically uh, but the simple matter is if you really want to dig into a crowd you touch their emotions and manipulate their emotions uh, i talked to one guy who had been part of the campus crusade for christ and he said uh, knowing, knowing how to emotionally appeal to a crowd is incredibly important in religious gatherings and he said I could teach you pretty quickly what some of the key points are. And I won't go into that, but it's, it's true. In politics and religion, uh, emotion tends to overpower reason. And we've, of course, seen some uh, phrases come up in American politics. You've probably heard those, lock her up, build the wall, drain the swamp. It's an example of propaganda. I'm not saying that uh, one party or the other has is, is, uh, got a monopoly on propaganda. Both of them use it. Okay, another thing that tends to happen in fascism is anti-intellectualism. And uh, right now, uh, there's a, a gentleman, I won't, I'm not sure I should call him a gentleman, the Prime Minister of Hungary is Viktor Orban. And uh, he, right now, has condemned schools as sites for liberal indoctrination nationalized the school systems, getting rid of local uh, control, and introduced a professional organization that all teachers have to join. So it's not like you've got independent teachers unions. He set up his own uh, teachers organization and everybody has to get into that one and listen to what he says. Uh, but we can see that. Uh, Education expertise and language distinctions tend to be undermined by fascist movements in favor of tribal identity. And I will take a swipe at Rush Limbaugh. Uh, he came on one of his shows and said the four corners of deceit were government, academia, science, and the media. That's, that's clearly anti-intellectualism. Women's movements are also strongly denounced by fascists. Uh, the women in the United States are known for their uh, ability to speak up, get involved in politics, and particularly in Colorado. Uh, we have a very, very high percentage of women legislators here. So I'm very proud of uh, the women of Colorado. Okay, another... We lost Ron's sound. Yes, Ron, if you can hear us, we lost your sound and you're frozen on my screen. So you might be having a computer problem. Let's give him a minute. Your internet connection is unstable. Hmm, it's telling me. Can you hear me? Yes, you're okay now. Okay. Huh? Uh, during this last election, there was a, a Pizzagate theory claiming that young children were, for sex were getting tra trafficked out of a pizza joint in Washington, D.C. And some guy actually showed up there with a gun to go rescue the children. <laughs> uh, in Poland, uh, there's a picture of a crashed plane there. Uh, the Polish prime minister in 2010 and his wife, as well as the entire General Army Command, and the president of the National Bank were all on this plane. They were due to land in Russia for a memorial service 
and they all died when the plane crashed in the woods before the runway. Uh, it was claimed that the Russians had done it, but uh, the investigation clearly showed it was pilot error. In fact, the air traffic controller at the uh, Russian airport had actually told the plane, the fog is terrible, don't even try to land. It's a terrible idea, taking a big risk. Those are some examples of uh, conspiracy theories. You've probably heard about the QAnon one now. I won't go into it other than to say it's pretty ridiculous. Uh, another aspect of uh, fascism is to try to set up a hierarchy. And when we say set up a hierarchy, it's to put your political, ethnic, national, or religious group, your tribe, up at the top of a hierarchy and to uh, put other people below you in the hierarchy. Uh, Alexander Stevens was the vice president of the Confederate States. And he gave a famous speech, speech called the Cornerstone Speech. And a quote out of that, those who would deny racial inferiority were fanatics. And uh, yeah, uh, there's a couple, uh, and of course, Hitler uh, very much uh, imposed the hierarchy, and he said that the Nordic race was superior and should dominate. And there's a couple pictures of some very attractive uh, German folks, one of those whom is uh, model Claudia Schiffer. And uh, you've got to at least admit, yep, those folks are good looking, but they certainly aren't a superior race. Okay, another thing that shows up in fascism, according to Jason Stanley, is victimhood. Uh, the fascist leader will always try to make the dominant group feel that they are victimized with the prospect of sharing power equally with members of the minority race. Uh, in the United States, around 2050, the demographics project, the U.S. will become a majority minority country. In other words, the white race will not be over 50%. Uh, but however, I want to point out that it will still be the largest minority group of the tribes. In other words, if you take all the other tribes, American Indians, Blacks, uh, people from other nations like India, uh, Mexico, uh, South America, all those other tribes, lumped together will constitute a majority, but the white Americans will still be the largest uh, minority. It's not like the white race is gonna go away. All right, so fascist, not nationalism, is pres preservation of the domination of one tribe. It, uh, basically it says, let's keep our tribe in power and we don't wanna share and, and keep others out. Uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing some of that in our country right now and in European countries. Uh, as more immigrants come in, uh, in Europe, they're seeing immigrants, particularly from the Islamic and North African areas. Uh, we're seeing immigrants more from South America and Mexico. Uh, so we get what they call the white guy feelings. Uh, looking down at the hordes of others threatening to take what is theirs. And it manifests itself in backlash to women's rights, civil rights, and educational quotas for minority. Uh, I always laughed at the placard, keep the government out of my Medicare. All right, another aspect of uh, fascism uh, can be law and order. There's nothing wrong with law and order. Law and order is good, it's very good, but it can be manipulated by a fascist leader. Uh, in Switzerland even, as, as late as 2016, there was a far right SVP group that introduced a referendum in that country to expel immigrants. And immigrants even included second or third generation Swiss born residents uh, who had done some things as minor as a few parking violations. So Europe is having struggles with this. Uh, 
Also, they've, they've noted in our language, we tend to talk about they are criminals if they're outside of our group. If people in our group uh, misbehave or break the law, we make mistakes, they, may, they are criminals. Uh, in, in our country right now, we're seeing the opiate, opiate crisis actually concentrating itself in rural whites and displaced industrial white workers. Uh, another thing, fastest propaganda tends to focus on the dominant group having fear of its blood polluted by rape from minorities. That's an interesting one. Okay, and then there's sexual anxiety. It seems like sex comes into everything sometimes, doesn't it? Uh, fastest propaganda promotes fear of interbreeding and mixing and corrupting the nation with inferior blood. Hitler certainly pushed this concept very hard. Uh, in the movie To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, the big fear of the jury uh, at the trial was this black man who was going to sexually uh, take advantage of this white woman. Um, then in, uh, for an example, elsewhere in the world, uh, in Myanmar, which is what used to be called Burma, a wave of ethnic cleansing uh, is still going on to some degree, where a Muslim minority uh, is being very, very viciously and move, moved and attacked and, and worked on. Uh, and what set it off was when a, uh, a Buddhist woman was raped by some Rohingya men. So again, it seems like sexual uh, threats to the, the big group brings out an awful lot of fear uh, among uh, majority groups. Steve. Um, Ron, you want to take a few comments and questions? Yeah, let's do it. Um, well, this slide brings up a question, of course, uh, in Europe, they're having even greater immigration uh, pushback than we are. So is this rise in fascism coming from more and more immigrants coming into Europe and America? Oh, very definitely. It's having a huge, it's having a huge impact on the it's creating uh, what I call white nationalist backlash. Yeah. We're going to look at it at uh, three or four European countries in just a minute here. And talk especially to especially uh, in France right now, what's happened in France so at, the, uh, at the church and uh, also in Paris. Oh, the stabbing at the Catholic yes. Church? Um, yes, the backlash aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. In World War II, uh, many of you might have heard of the Malamini Massacre, where uh, a couple hundred US soldiers were machine gunned by the Nazis in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, but there was also, in that same area, a 333rd artillery unit that was all black men. And they were captured by Germans on December 17th, 1944. And they were not only murdered, but it looks like they were uh, brutally, uh, you know, tortured and, and uh, killed most heinously um, by the Germans who had, seemed to at that time have a particularly hatred of uh, black men. Okay, another uh, thing we find out in, in fascism, there's also all, often an appeal to the heartland. Uh, in chapter one of Mein Kampf, Hitler said uh, he really loved his birthplace, which was called Grunau on the Inn, and it was kind of a little town in the farmland, and Hitler had to move away from that and go into Vienna as a young man. In chapter two, uh, he talks about how much he detest uh, Vienna. He said it was a poisonous snake. He despised its Jewish population. It's a mixture of different cultural and racial groups, uh, which included you know, the many you see there. And he said the pure German values were the rural values realized in the peasant life, pure Nordic blood. So he said it was the German farmland where, which, 
which was the heart of the nation. That's where the real patriotic great Germans were, that these cities were uh, cesspools of mixing, and he didn't like it. He criticized the mixing of pure Nordic blood in the cities, and he said the music, theater, art, movies promoted corruption of morals. And uh, he said the family farm and rural communities were optimal and they were not to be polluted by immigrants. It also promoted his invasion of Russia. He wanted to get the Ukraine so he could get vast, vast good farmland areas to expand Germany into and get a higher population of uh, farming kind of German people. Uh, Quick, quick note in the United States, uh, the area in red there has 50% of the population and the area in orange has the other 50%. And this shows you that even in our country, there's a, a tremendous concentration of the population in uh, really relatively few areas in a small area. And that bothers a lot of people. Okay, uh, one of the final things that uh, is noted in the book by Jason Stanley, he says is dismantling public welfare and unity. Us, we're industrious and law abiding and have earned our freedoms through work and they are lazy, perverse, corrupt and decadent. Their language of social justice is out to destroy our culture and traditions and make us, make us look weak. And Madeline Albright has a nice uh, quote in her book. She said, there's a tipping point where loyalty to one's own tribe curdles into resentment and hatred, then aggression towards others. And that's when fascism can take hold. Okay, we're gonna very quickly blow through a couple slides on uh, some European countries. France has a national rally party. Uh, Marine Le Pen is, the leader of that, it, it promotes uh, the message of hardline security and anti-immigration. And she appeals mostly to the population outside of the large cities and then the farm areas of France. Uh, she, she uh, uh, the rural areas often have a perception that a larger per capita share of their tax dollars are going to the urban areas, but it's, that's not true. And the fastest policies feed the myth that the hardworking rural residents pay to support the lazy urban dwellers. Okay, quick look at Hungary, Poland, and Turkey. And interestingly enough, the European Union has uh, issued some warnings to Hungary and Poland and said that the uh, democratic, uh, judicial systems in Hungary and Poland uh, are being, are under threat. And it, it paints a, a bleak picture in those two countries. It found that the Hungary in particular, Hungary in particular remained very limited in its uh, judicial uh, democracy. And Poland was falling short more and more in terms of uh, democracy there. Okay, we, we mentioned Viktor Orban. Uh, I read in the paper this morning where not Hungary, but Poland just out had a vote, or no, it wasn't a vote. Poland has always had very, very strict abortion rules. And their Supreme Court ruled that the very few exceptions they had for abortion are being eliminated mainly if you detect a congenital defect in the fetus early, Poland used to allow an abortion, but they said, no, can't do that anymore. <clears throat> Poland also had a very, very close and a polarized election and the right-wing party, uh, abbreviated the PIS, the Law and Justice Party, won an outright majority in the parliament. And uh, most of their politicians are anti-immigrant, abhor homosexuality. They've created laws to allow them to fire and hire the broadcasting chiefs, Poland's radio and TV stations. 
So uh, President Duda uh, is really moving Poland toward a much, much more uh, near fascist kind of society. Turkey. Uh, if I can pronounce his name, I probably can't. Recep Erdogan was granted near dictatorial powers in a 2017 referendum. It was not supported by the people of the three largest Turkey cities, like Constantinople, but had really strong support in the more rural areas of Turkey. And Turkey is now having greater conflict with many of the European nations and with the US. Uh, so right now there's tremendous tension over it next to Turkey in Armenia and Azerbaijan. And they're having some border uh, wars, semi small wars, clashes uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And Turkey is kind of getting involved in this, in these clashes. So there's some bad news from Europe, Turkey, Poland, Hungary are all uh, are in a bit of trouble. Okay, uh, wrap up two slides, uh, and we're going to get into the questions. Then, uh, democracy is always in some degree of danger from fascism. It's it's something we're always going to have to uh, be aware of and, and at all times, but especially when there are uncertainties. There's pandemics, economic crisis, social unrest or rapid societal shifts, like immigration, we're in more danger of uh, falling into uh, fascist elements. And uh, we should be aware of any, of near worship of any religious, political, or entertainment figure or movement demands total loyalty and adherence. And we have a picture there of the Jonestown, Guyana, Kool-Aid event, as I call it, in 1978, where 900 people went down there to uh, South America and all drank the uh, Kool-Aid. It wasn't Kool-Aid brand, but it was, but yeah, they, they forced everybody, including an awful lot of children, to all commit suicide. So it's certainly an extreme warning against a, a leader who takes uh, total control of people. Okay, here's our last slide, and let's open the floor to uh, questions. Madeline Albright, and I can't say enough good things about her book, closes her book with these uh, 10 um, questions. We should, she said we should need to ask of prospective leaders. So uh, let's get some comments. Take, take a look at those and uh, let's get some com comments from all of you out there on, on these issues. Ron, I have a question Hi, to you. With all the reading that you just did, how are they getting people, this movement, to get other people to jump on this movement? I, you know, how are they selling? I mean, how are, you know, how is that happening? Well, are you referring to diff the different European countries? Well, European countries and even kind of what we're seeing here, you know, it, it, the support of fascism, you know, how is... How, what's the, the reason for people to jump on board and support fascism? You know, what, what, have you read, read anything? Uh, often, well, as, as uh, Madeline said, it's, it's when people feel their status and position is being threatened, their tribe, hmm. uh, particularly they're, they're not as dominant as they used to be. And they're they're scared of uh, losing their their dominant position. Hmm. Ron, Does inequality and poverty have anything to do with it? Inequality, their feelings of inequality and poverty increasing. Does that have anything to do with it? Uh, yeah, that's that's been, people people can uh, if they feel like their their job opportunities are closing down. There's, there's people in this country right now that feel like uh, um, the jobs have gone away from uh, some of the uh, white rural areas in particular, that where factories have closed, steel mills are gone, and they feel very frustrated uh, that, that the 
job opportunities for, for particularly rural white males who are don't have college educations really feel like they're being threatened, pushed out by uh, minorities and, and others. Ron, when was this list uh, generated? Uh, Madeline's book is very recent. I've got it right here. And uh, it's no more, it's, it wasn't in the, it's no more than two years old. Still and, pretty prophetic. Yeah. It, uh, I'm, I'm fumbling through here. Fumbling. It's, it's quite recent on it. I wanted to pull a surprise or not a pull a surprise, but it was a number one New York bestseller. It's just, it's, it's been in the last four years. It's not a, it's not an old book. I think it was 2017 or 2018. It's quite recent. Ron, I have friends who would look at this list and say it's all left-wing propaganda. How can we counteract that? Uh, I think you have to, well, you can say Madeleine Albright was yep. the Secretary of State yep. under the uh, Obama administration. So you could argue that she sees it uh, mm -hmm. through shaded glasses. Mm -hmm. uh, but she also, in her book, uh, gives copious examples from all over the world of things she's seen, uh, even things that affected her life. And uh, I think if you read her, if you read the entirety of the book, you get a perspective uh, showing she's got knowledge from real life experience. But yeah, it's you could you could argue that yeah, some people may not like this list. Reason always takes second place to fear, as you <laughs> were pointing out, correct? Yep. You make I like that overpowers the frontal cortex. <laughs> I like that part too, Ron, that you brought out that it it's an appeal to emotion and uh, simple solutions and simple slogans for simple people. And um, that seems a natural thing that people are always going to be drawn to the simple solutions and emotional appeals rather than the more complicated gray areas that really are so many of these social and political issues. It's just, uh, and we see that on every level, federal and local races too. It's just a natural human tendency, I think, to want to simplify and whip up emotion. Mm -hmm. So if you're Joe Everyman or Josephine Every Woman, how do you avoid becoming the target of fas fascism? How do you avoid, how do you like protect yourself in a very narrow, dangerous world? Alice just said critical thinking and logic. Uh, more education, teaching people to uh, look at uh, evidence more carefully, to do more reflection, to even recognize their own weaknesses and errors. Ron, this is Karen Alexander. I tend to agree with you a lot. I think there's a lot of hard work that goes into being informed. Um, it's looking at the other side. It's reading about history. It is listening to Fox News. It is listening to the other side. There's a lot of hard work that goes into um, awareness. And what I, I have several family members who um, are, it, it's almost impossible to talk to them. And when I've had conversations, Bob and I talk about it a lot, and we just come back and say, they're just uninformed. And it's, it's really hard work to 
go through, I've been doing a lot of reading about history and how did we get to the place that we are? It takes time, it takes work. You have to really study this. And I just, um, I, I think that's a challenge for, for people who are lending themselves or we, we see them lending themselves towards fascism. I'm not even sure that they realize what it is. I think you're, I think you get a lot closer to being balanced if you're willing to do some self examination, particularly of your psychological profile, and to at least be able to admit, uh, I've come to this position, and here are some of my underlying um, factors in my life that have put me at this position, and to be able to see what's driven yourself to certain uh, political uh, opinions. I, Ron, and I think we, more people need to be better read. I'm, I'm still stunned at how few people read uh, things that they should read. I'm Ron, impressed. Go ahead. Go ahead, Eugene. No, I, I'm impressed, uh, uh, Ron, by Ben Sass of Nebraska, the support that he has from his fellow Nebraskans. Uh, remember, he, he covers a lot of rural territory, but the, the support he seems to garner uh, from across the aisle there in the state of Nebraska and being able to bridge. He, he has what Mark was certainly getting across very eloquently today, the, the matter of compassion, but also being a progressive Republican as he is. So I, I commend the, the, certainly the book he recently has written called Them, T-H-E-M, by Senator Ben Sass as a bridge builder, certainly. Uh, and, and votes speak for themselves. I was impressed listening to President Obama yesterday speaking in Detroit. And at one point he said, we in the political arena can't solve all the problems. He said, we can work on some areas and make them better. I, th and I thought that was a real admission that political leaders can't solve all the problems of this country, but they can hopefully make improvements and move the, move the marker in the right direction. Ron, let me play devil's advocate for just one question here. And that being, shouldn't progressives be a little more understanding of the nationalism feeling that our, we've got too many immigrants coming in, they're gonna destroy our culture and take our jobs. Shouldn't progressives, um, including Joe Biden is a Democrat, talk to that and try and allay those fears a little bit more instead of just coming at them with uh, such force. You know what I'm saying? We do need, yeah, we do need some immigration laws uh, and we need to, do need to enforce them. So it's, it's we, can, we can't just open the gates and say, send me everybody, we'll, we're here to absorb them. We unfortunately do have to set limits. But we need to treat them as human beings and not separate them as, as separate families. And, right. you know, you, you know, it's, it's, you're right, I think, um, um, Steve, you know, you practice a little, it's like what Mark said today, political compassion, practice some political compassion and not be so on the other side black either. You know, it's not so black and white, you know, we're all people and, but yeah, well said, Steve. Thank you. So can I changed the oh, screens. Can we change the screen so we can see everybody and take the shared screen off? Oh, okay. Well, I, I wanted to leave up those questions, but. Uh, if, if people want to keep yeah. seeing these, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. I think we've seen them long enough too, Ron. If you don't mind, okay. please. Okay, I'll, I'll knock it out. Yeah. There we go. Buddy. Enjoy seeing everybody else. There we go. Sorry about that. It's okay. Okay. So in my experience with working or, or trying to talk to people who 
um, have more of this fearful, um, fear to the point of anger and defensiveness um, is to not relate to them on a logical, uh, reasoned, uh, educated basis. Because all of those things are suspect, but to relate on a more emotional basis. So when I go on and watch Tucker Carlson and then add my comments to the comments below, which are very um, elevated in terms of emotion, that I try to speak real calmly, say, I'm in a, I'm in a, patri I'm in a patriotic, patriotic, this is how I feel. And that actually has been really effective at taking down the level of, um, oh, what do I say, kind of angst and ire that I've seen in the past in those, in those uh, comment boards. So it's relating to those people on an emotional level because that's how they're thinking is emotionally. Here, here. Here. I've particularly seen fear. Are we still out there, everybody? Yeah. Still yeah. Here. You know, Ron, I've been thinking, you know, her, you know, we talk about, I think everybody's got uh, relatives that are on one side or the other. You know, and it, it seems like it, it, the kind of people that you, you've never, they've worked hard their whole life, a, in a, like everybody does, but I, I think about, they can't see it all any other way. Like I was never provided anything. No one gave me anything, you know, so certain aspects of fascism appeal to them, but yet at the same time, they're, they're still collecting social security and Medicare. So it seems a little uh, amiss that that seems, you know, um, interesting. It's an interesting problem. Ron, is fascism the same as nationalism today? Do we understand it more as nationalism and isolationism today? Than the uh, word fascism? No, I think, you know, and that's the trouble with it, defining what fascism is. Uh, nationalism in itself uh, is, is not necessarily bad. It's, it's good to have national pride, uh, a desire and love for the country. But when it goes to an extreme and you start exalting your own nation above everybody and everything, then it's gone too far. Did any of your readings uh, give any suggestions on how to counter the trend? Uh, I think, uh, no, the books didn't focus on that. Although I need to continue reading uh, Madeline's book. She, she says that uh, we need to always push the uh, push democracy, uh, more education, more reasoned uh, discussions, more trading notes, uh, less us versus them fighting. But no, there's no single list in these books of uh, all the methods to uh, stop fascism. How does uh, capitalism play into this? Uh, I, I'm just kind of curious. That's, you know, that's kind of a byword now. Uh, you know, anti, almost anti-capitalist on, on the uh, on the left side. I would think that capitalism hates fascism because fascism is about divides and about um, kind of uh, us versus them. And it's a, it's a big distraction. And what capitalism is really good for is peace. Capitalism loves peace because then people 
aren't distracted with war, they buy things. And so I would think that capitalism um, kind of wants kind of an apolitical, just get online and push those, those buy buttons kind of culture. I could be wrong, but that's what it makes me think about. Trade does tend to break down uh, hostilities between nations. Uh, if it wasn't for the enormous amount of trade going on between the United States and China right now, who knows, we'd be much, much more hostile. But I still pick up items and see made in China uh, everywhere. <laughs> and just drink of water. Boy, boy. We've got about three minutes left. And Ron, could I throw out one more question to you? Sure. Um, I think there's kind of a, cons a consensus or a general feeling, even around the world, that uh, that more people are moving into big cities and becoming more educated and seeing democracy, democratic principles on the internet, and that uh, we are going to move away from the idea of nationalism and fascism and move more toward democracy across the world. But we're not really seeing that play out. Um, and so that may not be true, is a more frequent comment now. We're, we shouldn't just assume that democracy is going to sweep across the world eventually. It might, there might continue to be fascist type of uh, governments for a long, long time. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. In fact, I, I recommend that everybody read uh, Madeline's Al Albright's book. If for nothing else to give us, we as Americans tend to be quite frankly, quite ignorant and blind of uh, all the things going on in the world. And uh, as I read the book, I, I was reminded how I need to get a better understanding of a lot of international situations and not be so I think, focused on I think many young people who argue a lot about what's happening do not read and understand. They don't dig into it so they really know what's going on, what the truth is. They think, okay, it bothers me that they're doing what they're doing, but I don't know why. I don't know all of that. I just think I don't like it. They don't really well, yeah, understand. I, I, I would you know, I would argue against that since I have three daughters that are younger and say that whatever our kids are is a world that we've created for them. Mm. Okay, so, you know, I, I have three daughters that are incredibly well read and they're well read because their mother is well read. Mm. And like I said, culturally, whatever we want to say about the millennials, keep in mind that it's a world that we've created for them. And, and so, you know, that, that's just my take on it. I'm, I'm very careful with young people because I think they get a bad rap. Um, and I, I think we need to spend a lot of time thinking about our own position in, in their world and what they're dealing with um, before we're too harsh on them. That, that's, that's just my point of view. Well, I have three daughters, four daughters, and they all think they have an opinion, but they don't, they don't watch Fox News. They don't, they, they just think in their little world, this is what would be better for me. If the government gave me free health, that would be fine. They don't really know what is behind all of that. They're not as good readers as your daughters probably are. We have um, two sons and a daughter, all of whom are extremely um, well focused on what's going on around them, well read, very um, forward thinking. And because of them, I feel like we're passing along the world to uh, a, a, a next generation who has things in hands. I'm confident in that. So. I agree a lot with what Jerry said in that I think so much of it is what kind of an example we're setting and what news is reporting. And so much of the news is, is focused on only what's happening 
in our own country and very, very little of it is focused on the world, depending yeah. on what we want. That's true. Mm -hmm. So, I well, think... my grandkids, which are high school and college, mostly college, they are better read than my own daughters who are 50, yeah. 60 years old. Yeah. It's, a, it, it's a difference. I mean, yeah. nowadays, young people that are high school and college are really digging into it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. That uh, reminds me, we should probably wrap up, but I also want to encourage everybody to watch BBC News at night, the nightly news there. That's where you get the international news, not on the American networks. Right. BBC and PBS is really good on that. At five, it's at five o'clock every day. Five o'clock. Yeah. BBC. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, yeah, it's on PBS at five o'clock. And okay. uh, you get a different view of the way they see us and the way what else is going on in the world. And then I watch our news right at, you know, the, our national yeah. news after that at 530. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Democracy Now! is also a good source. There's also a German, uh, uh, and it's in English, but a, a German's, uh, and it's all public uh, TV. All, all of that. And so you and on, have to watch the ads in between. <laughs> thank you, Riggs. And on cable, of course, there's every kind of news from every country, too. You can watch Japanese news, um, Saudi Arabian news, all kinds, which is interesting to tune into for a little while sometimes. Encourage those, too. Ron, we got to wrap up. Any more thoughts? No, other than uh, vote if you have keep, it, keep reading and keep voting. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Your talks are always informative. Very good. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great discussion. Thank you, Thank you Ron. Ron. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Let's pray, Let's pray for yeah. the, voter, the voters and the candidates on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for being Thank with us. We will see you next week. Thank okay. You, Steve. Thank you, Ron. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. It was great. Bye. -bye. All right.